It's October the 22nd, 2015. I'm Dana Durnford, also known as the nuclear proctologist.org. And you can find my videos and Fukushima presentations at Beautiful Girl by Dana on YouTube. So today's episode is about the tsunami. It's episode eight of uh, Fukushima Meltdown. And I use Fukushima Meltdown, not in the context of Fukushima Meltdown, but is in the context of just people and environment and society and structure and order melting down, not meltdowns. And I should, in one sense, I suppose I should, but this is just the way, the way I see it. And I, and I can't put the S on the end of the name for some reason. It's Fukushima Meltdown to me for some reason. That's the name of it. And today's, uh, you know, once again, I'm going to drive home that point. Uh, permanently every time is that three meltdowns. Each of these are three times the size of Chernobyl. Each of these were 100% Chernobyl. On top of that was a 30% and Chernobyl was once again one third the size. And Chernobyl stopped after 10 days. These reactors didn't. And Chernobyl was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. So I want you to just think about, you know, an earthquake. And I think I got a better way of doing things from here on out just to make sure nobody mistakes what I'm saying. And I'm not going to be streaming monitor alongside of me, but I do have the comments there. And good morning to everybody. And I was catching your comments before I went live. Thank you. That beautiful girl by Dana, the live chat is going. And I'll come in after. I'm going to address some of that. And, uh, you know, because we should, I'll act, the show is one hour long, so at the end of the one hour, I should spend at least 15 minutes to make sure, because there's so many people chatting. There might be an impertinent question there that everybody is trying to convey to me, and I'm not able to catch it because it's so difficult uh, to do the things I'm doing. And then, and I just keep repeating that because over the next month I'll get better at it. And you won't hear me say it no more, hopefully. But right now it's very difficult. And so this earthquake came through the country at 9,000 miles an hour. That's all I wanted to explain to you. Besides the fact that it lasted six minutes, and besides the fact that it shook the whole country for six minutes, and besides the fact that this was an unimaginable earthquake on the scale of considered a thousand times worse than Haiti. If that's not terrifying enough, a tsunami ran through the country 50 minutes later. And a tsunami doesn't travel like a turtle. It travels like a supersonic jet. And so the first wave comes in, the next one comes immediately over it at five or six hundred miles an hour. The next one is coming over it at five or six hundred miles an hour, and the next one. And so this thing in updates the entire country immediately and it eradicates and turns everything in like a wood chipper, a massive wood chipper. I got no other way of conveying you know, that kind of damage. I don't know how to convey that These kind of damage. From a it's not something that, City, Miyagi, over one you know, that we've talked about throughout history and had big debates rising. about how much energy, blah, blah, blah. Because if you look at a river, a river runs down, Which is running down a hill, and but it's not running as fast as this. And the river goes around bends and nooks and crannies and it carved these out just through sheer time but also sheer energy. But what you're seeing behind me, that's Niagara Falls coming through your neighborhood. That kind of energy. And But uh, think about it, doing it to 1,500 miles of the coastline. 1,500 miles or 500 miles of the coastline at the same time. Because it travels so fast, it updated the whole coast immediately. Now there's 14 reactors were affected by the earthquake and the tsunami. Huh? The earthquake, Dana, and the tsunami, or just the tsunami? No, no, both of them. Because the earthquake was traveling at 9,000 miles an hour. It was a thousand times worse than Haiti. And we know what Haiti done. And people say, oh, Dana, you know, they had poor structured buildings down there. It didn't matter what you had there at that kind of a earthquake. And the scales of earthquake are not one to 10. It's one to two, and between one to two, it's a finite difference. 
it leads to a hundred fold. But from two to three, it's another hundred fold. But that number, take that number, is it right? Now, it's a hundred fold again to four. And all the way up to nine. And so that's why this was so devastating and, and so in, insane. But to, today, I really want to... I really want to say and just sit on Fukushima's tsunami because you can't cover that one enough. And a lot of people have seen this material if they've been on my site before. Because if I go out, I have to go find other stuff when this is the major stuff. And so what do you want to see? The major stuff or new stuff all the time? And new stuff all the time is going to get pretty boring because the major stuff is the bling bling. And that tells the story, right? Just in one picture, is the tsunami debris from 500 miles of coastline, is 2,000 miles by 2,000 square miles, because 500 miles of coastline was wiped apart, and so was 14 reactors, and their fuel pools, and their common spent fuel pools, and their waste facilities. Now, it's not just... <coughs> it's not just... You know, it gets all swept out into the ocean. No. That's why they have a billion tons of debris that they're burning in the incinerators of radioactive debris. And plus, they got 2,000 square miles out on the ocean. Now the enormity of that earthquake and tsunami, and you got to realize that Japan is the same size as California, and it has 54 reactors, and California only has a few. But an earthquake, uh, this is built on low-lying land. And so that tsunami, this is some of the debris. I'm going to scratch my ear there. You can see you can see some of the debris that showed up. Texas-sized tsunami debris field headed towards the West Coast. Uh, so episode, pilot episode of this, you'll find links below. And also over at my website at beautiful, um, nuclearproctologist.org. I put another little section up there last night. And hopefully the weekend I'll start uploading more pictures again. I got like a week and a half off. I just come back off the ocean and I jump straight into the streams. But this section here got all the episodes. And these are all, and this is section two up here in the corner. Section one is filled up. You can't put any more sections in there. And the first 40 or 50 sections got a thousand pictures on each page. Let it load up for a long time. But after that, it's uh, 200 pictures on each page. And uh, that would look like, which is the front page today, uh, Steppen's Islands. That's the most recent expedition. Uh, but I'll come back to that after. Texas-sized tsunami debris field headed towards the West Coast. Texas. So everything you're seeing there is radioactive contaminated. That's why they got a billion tons of radioactive contaminant. So when people say there was no radioactive till after the detonations at the Fukushima Daiichi plant, there was 14 reactors. And so the only reactors that they're opening up are on the west coast, not the east coast, the open ocean, because they were wiped out. Everything in Japan on the coastline um, was completely uh, annihilated and destroyed. This is what it used to look like. And can you imagine living, uh, I guess that's what it looked like, was it? What do I know? No, no, that's before, that's the plowed it all out. Okay, I see. This is after they cleaned it up, but before they cleaned it up, it looked like that. That's just one picture. That's not too bad when you consider and so they superimposed one picture alongside the other one. But it looks at that. And so you see the debris field sweeping across everything. It's just shocking how much energy these things had. And this is stuff that showed up in North America typically uh, before and after they cleaned it up. But that's not, they got the streets clean there, right? Because you can see cars there on the road. The roads are all clean. Uh, but when, when they finally got rid of the debris, you can see what was left over. She was gutted. They got off pretty easy, all things considered. But that's still, 
unimaginable damage and you can see how high the water was you can see how high the water was um, and just because that house is dear do you that's that's not livable salt water has all you know it has a million creatures or billion creatures in a glass of salt water and as soon as they start rotting they'll stink up your gear so as a commercial diver I would flush my gear with fresh water all the time because I was diving in the ocean six hours a day uh, both the Atlantic and the Pacific and extensively and so I can tell you a thing or two about that but yeah so anyway they got that all plowed out and so that's a good idea or a good look at what most of the coastline would look like but this is radioactive debris and so every time it rains or snows, anything that's found its way into the sediment or in these landfills or this stuff that's highly radioactive, they hit it with a Geiger counter, it goes to the incinerators at a different prefecture. Then they burn it and re-liberate it back into the communities. And we covered those headlines extensively in these episodes and we will continue to cover these headlines. But the almighty power, the enormity of that power after striking how it... it so how could a nuclear power plant and the infrastructure, a nuclear power plant all along the coastline needed that infrastructure that you see piled up into these corners? Right? So this is, um, and once again, let's just revisit for a few seconds that kind of uh, energy. Because we're the video is still going crazy. So you can, just a, just for a quick glimpse, because we can always come back to this a few times before it runs out, just to drive that point home for you. You know, it's no good sitting on top of that house, is it? But people were picked up 10 miles offshore on tops of houses. So, so the carnage was complete. Uh, it, it, did, it didn't rescue people that evening and then got to work on the power plants that night. And then everything was hunky dory the next morning. There was communities down there they couldn't even get into for seven or eight days. You think anybody survived that? You think anybody like was waving at a helicopter when he flew over that the next morning? Can you imagine what that was like to spend a night there? People did survive it, I'm sure, but can you imagine what it was like to spend not many? That's a wood chipper. They survived the wood chipper. Whoever survived that is full of huge gouges and scratches and broken ribs and, and, and a smashed up face and head and, and radiated on top of that. And then the government hiding it away and then the plumes were coming right over them. They were sitting in all of these piles throughout Japan when the reactors throughout Japan were blowing up and being radiated. And so the cover story was Fukushima. We'll admit to Fukushima, and then we'll bury it a couple of years later. That Fukushima got problems. And get the whole world's media to focus in only on the Diachi. And we've covered the other reactors. We've still got lots more to cover about those other reactors. <coughs> and just let me bang a couple of headlines in there. Dana... Bum, 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 bum. Let me find a couple of these headlines that I recently Japan Times 28 out of every 100 Fukushima pregnancies resulted in miscarriages or abortions Prime Minister ordered the cooling after he was advised seawater could cause a chain reaction they sprayed seawater on these reactors throughout Japan's coastline all 14 of the reactor plants that have multiple reactors because that's all he could do because the, the, the country just went through a wood chipper there was no telephone poles that's the gallows laugh large amount of sea water salt water found in reactor number five game over trying to stop the reactor from eroding May the 16th yeah they were probably just getting in there May the 16th High radiations levels around the plant prevented helicopters from dumping water on the spent fuel rods. Chernobyl sent in 600 pilots. They all died of radiation 
Ellen says some of them fell right in on the reactor with the helicopters. And Chernobyl was one third the size of any of the reactors. Chernobyl was a 30% meltdown. Chernobyl stopped after 10 days. Chernobyl was using graphite. Chernobyl didn't have to spend fuel pools burning. Or um, Fukushima had all of this and, and didn't have common spent fuel pools with 9 million pounds in it right on the ground. That tsunami was 50 feet high. If Fukushima reactors melted down in severity, would fire exceed that of the Chernobyl? Any of the reactors, not all of the reactors, but any of the reactors are three times the size of Chernobyl. Three times the inventory minimum. Well, the reactors in Japan were holding around 5 million pounds, around 200,000 rods, and each rod is 18 pounds, 12 feet long. There's 3,450 assemblies and 80 rods in an assembly. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Would well, fire exceed the Chernobyl? <laughs> Leading Japanese paper, Fukushima will now be compared to Chernobyl. March the 16th. Uh, they're going to use this now to beat up the nuclear industry. Not the whole country is now radiated. Not, oh my goodness, what have we done? No. No, they're going to beat up the nuclear industry because a bunch of people in Japan are now going to get cancer. So cancer doesn't show up right away. Does that mean people haven't got it? Cancer doesn't get diagnosed for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Does that mean they haven't got it? Even though they're alluding now that Workers got leukemias. Why not tell us about all the homeless that are missing? The 800 we know, anyway, that are missing. That went in there and no one's ever seen them after. And they were right alongside the rods that will kill you in one minute. Will melt your organs permanently just being too close to it. You will die two weeks later just because you walked past it. The guinea pigs that they're still sending in there... No good asking Harvard, or Yale, or Berkeley, or Stanford, or MIT, because they haven't been in there. And they're not going to. Over 30,000 square kilometers of Japan blanketed, blanketed by radioactive cesium. Blanketed. Okay, let's go back to the tsunami. Hang on. I'll find something useful. Hang on. There we go. So, 30,000 square kilometers is that debris, too. And so they're scooping that up and burning that in incinerators. That's radioactive tsunami debris. Tsunami mixed it all together. Have you ever baked a cake? Huh? Yeah, you put stuff in there, then you mix it and it disappears in the cake mix. You ever see that? Pretty weird, isn't that? You ever mix paint? That kind of, I'm just reaching out there to try to help people kind of grasp that all the reactors are spewing out this stuff. <laughs> because reactors are not made of kryptonite. Yeah. So the tsunami, you know, you can see the debris posited up on top of the roof. So look at the car up on top of that roof. Right? How do you think that got up there? Do you think they were shooting the movie down there and they put that up there in the tsunami? They weren't able to take it down because they got all the movie equipment took away and they left the car there. And somebody was exploiting that and saying, look, there was a tsunami. And everybody's like, you're a conspiracy theorist, Dana. There's no tsunami. There's no meltdowns for four and a half years. There's no radioactive fallout, but we're burning a billion tons of radioactive fallout. But there's none, Dana. And so it's ridiculous that people say that kind of stuff, but they do, right? Bloop, bloop. And so your intakes are right on the coastline for your reactors. Your, your intakes are down there somewhere. If there was a reactor here, they'd be down where these trees are. That's where you'd be pumping in a million gallons a minute. A minute. And so the reactors can't go into a cold shutdown without a million gallons a minute for a couple of days. Now, if you take away the infrastructure, they can't get a million gallons a minute because it has to be forced through to take away the heat. And all your reactors, boiling water reactors, consume a million gallons a minute. And so if they're consuming 2 billion uh, gallons a day at these plants, 
about 35 to 40 million gallons are going back into the environment but they're they're so warm that they'll destroy life in that localized area and so if it's a big river where the plants are to they're trying to require the nuclear plants to cool the water down that didn't evaporate and so what they done was a glass of salt water so out of 2.2 uh, .2 billion gallons a day say 40 billion went back into the ocean but the rest of it was evaporated. So they killed all, in a glass of water, each glass of water in that 2.2 billion gallons, gallons, 16 glasses of water in a gallon times 22. But anyway, that's a billion creatures that they just evaporated. So how can a nuclear, anything about a nuclear plant be good? But when you take out the whole infrastructure on the coastline, right along there, how is it going to get into the plant until you restore power? And so after an hour and a half, 90 minutes, each, plant, each reactor is missing 90 million gallons. And so now it's starting to melt down. Once it starts to melt down, you can't restore it. That's the problem. That's why, they have, that's why these plants are so expensive, so they never have that happen to them. And so they hide that away from you in desperation. To hang on to their pensions, to hang on to their uh, jobs, to have that prestige. It's not to, they don't want people to know how dangerous it is, so they tell you it's like a banana, a potato chip, walking in sunshine. And so, once again, let's do two seconds on that video. Hang, 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 hang with me, because you got to realize how much stuff I got on these computers. <laughs> So this wood chipper, this meat grinder, this machine of hell, this machine of destruction, this machine that just destroys, there is nothing can withstand it. There is nothing that can come out on top. And the earthquake that went through it at 9,000 miles an hour for six minutes had already weakened all these structures dramatically, no matter how good they were built. Once this comes through your community, it's full of debris and trucks and buildings and houses. Do you think anything you got in your community is going to withstand that kind of torque, that kind of bombardment? Like I can, I can equate to it because I dove in the Atlantic Ocean when the ice would be 200 miles of pack ice on the coastline and each of these are many, many tons. And so I would dive underneath this and you would hear it pounding the shoreline the whole time. It's such hard ice. But it scrubs everything off the coastline, all the marine life. But in the spring, it completely loads it with babies. The ocean is a soup of life. But here in British Columbia, the ocean didn't recede its coastline uh, after the radiation came here. But I mean, my goodness! Let me keep going. Because we'll run out of time. And... We've got some good news coming up at the end of the episode. Uh, we're raising money for a TriCaster. And it's a $12,000 plus the lighting is $1,500. And I'll cover that at the end of it. And so we're really starting to move in the right direction all of a sudden. Uh, I'm feeling really good about it. And I'm going to just do it anyway, but this makes it a hell of a lot easier. Um, I'll just save it for the end anyway. We've raised a couple of thousand bucks, $2,000, which is just crazy for our first day officially raising money. And you can, uh, I'll, I'll cover that at the end. But that really helps. You know, I've done three interviews yesterday on top of that. And so I was pretty burned out. But that TriCaster, I never stopped talking about that with my friends <laughs> for weeks. I got them tortured. In fact, one of them wants to, at some point, if I can't get it, he's probably going to end up buying it for me. Uh, but that'll be too late for what I'm hoping for, I'm sure. But just because I, I don't stop talking about it. So the tsunami comes through the entire coastline, just pounding the guts out of everything, displacing everything. Uh, 2,000 square miles. You can see what the airport, that's a bad picture, I know. But that's planes and all the, the cars floating away. Uh, all this stuff... Hang on. 
And so just the enormity of it anyway, going throughout that country, and we'll get over to some headlines here in a second. Uh, I'm not sure what that picture is. I do know what this one is. And I, I don't know the weight on his shoulders, but I can only imagine, uh, you know, if he has any emotional attachment, uh, trigger reflexes, they're all firing right now. And these people here are, you know, I would like to read your book. Let's put it that way. And how do, how do you say the nuclear power plants are falling when your whole country is destroyed? You say that because you have an agenda and because you would make a living at it and because you couldn't get a job. Um, and so I can't really compare any kind of job because there's no... To me, there's no shame in the job you got if it's an honorable job. And I've done, I've, I've unloaded transport trucks for $20 a day years ago in order to get a stake to buy steel toe boots, a drill, a uh, carpenter's belt, and so that I can go to work drywalling making uh, $25 an hour. And I worked for a week at $20 a day. Um, I got caught out and I had to change careers and I didn't have the monies to keep paying the bills. And this is what I cooked up was go work temporary services for $20 a day. That was a long time ago, you know, I kind of forgot about it. But I I had a, I needed steel toe boots and I needed a drill and I needed a carpenter's belt. And then I phoned uh, every drywall company uh, in the yellow pages starting in A. And before that day was out, um, I had several offers and the next morning uh, I was put to work by myself in a skyscraper doing rooms, dry, dry wall, drywalling um, apartments or offices. And he just had no issues with me as soon as he met me and set me free and asked me, he kind of figured out I had everything brand new and that meant that I was jumping back into the game and so he supplied a lot of equipment for me. And But I mean, that's what I mean. These people... You can't drywall these houses and fix them, okay? You can't, you have to burn all that because the radioactive fallout landed on all of this. On top of the, the, the incarnage, the misery, the heartaches, the heartbreaks, the absolutely catastrophic event itself. You know, throughout the country, there's, this is just one spot where they, they happen to stay there, but throughout the country, this stuff was tossed through neighborhoods and tossed through communities and schools with children in it. Um, there's still more stuff I want to get through. We, I think we already got through all of that, have we? No, we're not through it all yet. I know we're not. Uh, so your homes are floating away. Have you ever had your home float away, you know? No, I haven't. Uh, but my dad, uh, when he was around six years old in Newfoundland, British uh, Canada, their home floated away. There was a tsunami came through there. Um and he's been dead for quite a long time. He died out fishing one day. Um, and so he told me stories about that and the, and the elders in the community have told me people uh, stories about that tsunami that came through. And uh, it was a really, you know, something that doesn't leave you very easy. And so in my own family, those stories still live today. Uh, and so these stories will live for infinity, if there was an infinity, without the radiation. See, the radiation is attached to everything. The radioactive fallout continued to come out. They couldn't clean this up before the radioactive fallout had its way with it. You couldn't do that. And then the 2,000 miles of debris, hang on a second. I know I forgot to cover something right away, Dina. So let's put it this way. The radioactive fallout, okay, keep that image in your mind for a second. So the reactors melted down right away. They detonated, they were inundated with this tsunami that was over the height of what you're looking at. I'm sorry, uh, the was about 50 feet high. So this debris, this 
This dispersal you see above me is 40 days. Yeah, 40 days. See that dispersal? That's just CCM. It doesn't include all the reactors. It doesn't even include this reactor here. It only includes the releases uh, from this one right here, Unit 2. See, that's not too bad looking, right? That's not going to give you any sleepless nights nice looking at that fella, is it? They don't include the models from Unit 4, and it didn't include the models from Unit 3, and it didn't include the models from Unit 1. Uh, okay, so it doesn't include any of those models. So look at that. That's coming out of Japan, and it's fallen down, right, into the ocean. Or is it also falling down on top of all that radio, all that debris coming across? Huh? You know what I'm saying to you? And so, this is the tsunami debris. And then, that's the radioactive fallout, but it's not including the ongoing, the constant, the endless, the perpetual motion machine it is. But I want you to consider that it's only for 40 days, but it didn't stop coming out of there 40 days, and it doesn't have the thousand elements in it that it's supposed to have in there. It doesn't have the fuel pools. It doesn't have all the reactors on the coastline. It doesn't have the modelings, the proper, any kind of context. But what it does tell you is that there was a massive release, and that's that's how it worked itself and played itself out. All right, because that's that was Noah's model, and so it's, it constantly landed on the debris. And even today, as it's coming out of there in a day or two, it will land on any debris that's there. And the cesium that's coming out and going into the ocean circulates and comes back to Japan in about twenty years. Right, makes that circle in about 20 years is back at Japan. So radioactive debris, and so the whole country, this was happening to the whole country originally, right? So that's what was happening to the country. This stuff was sitting here for months and months, and the radioactive fallout was landing on it for months and months. And you got billions of tons of, oh, I don't know, radioactive debris. Now you get it? So not only is it that radioactive debris, but those communities today, four and a half years later, even though it's cleaned up, are full of radioactive. The mountains are full of it. It washes, every time it rains, it washes down from those mountains, right? It washes back down into the community that they rebuilt there. That's what happens to the mountains. And so the heavy particles are coming in and they hit, the, they hit the mountains with the clouds uh, the, because they're picked up, you know. And this is happening. This is a perpetual machine. The whole country evaporates all day long and all over the world. We evaporate, go out in the morning and look at us. And that's full of these radioactive isotopes. And But Japan is devastated. And I just wanted to focus in on how bad they really... Because they're right there. There's reactors all over the country that had huge releases, if not 100% meltdowns. They can't open the reactor back up on the East Coast because they all melted down. And this stuff came over here. It's there. It's everywhere. So this picture, let me, let me double check what I'm looking at. That's after. And that's as the wood chipper came through. Hello, Tokyo. It's just coming ashore, right? So if you had a nuclear plant on the coastline, all that infrastructure gets destroyed, yeah? Yeah. And that's stuff that came over to North America, but the radiation can't come over here, Dana. Uh, just looking at the comment section. CBS News correspondent, John Blackstone. Radioactive debris showed up in North America. Scientists say it's like a banana and a potato chip from walking in sunshine. Just imagine if you used to go down that stairs every day. Now it looks like that. So I can't tell the difference between brand new stairs. They've done a pretty good job on the repairs. Okay, I shouldn't say that. Because homeless and, and victims all got radiated doing that. 
But honey, I'm home. If that's not an apocalyptic looking nightmare, I don't know what is. Oh, but the nuclear power plant there is okay, Dana boy. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. No, we got crap tonight. You see, the power plant needs all kinds of electricity externally that it, in order to run and to maintain its pumps and the fuel pools and everything else. The reactors are a byproduct. The energy from a reactor is just a byproduct of the chain reaction. You need a million gallons a minute just to keep it cool, and you evaporate that full of isotopes in the community. And so cancer is six times higher for women around breast cancer for around nuclear power plants. Leukemia is 20 times higher for children around nuclear power plants because it's always evaporating into your community. Radioactive isotopes, you can't contain it because they're noble gases, they'll detonate. And noble gases only need oxygen to detonate. They don't need a spark or a flame. They just need to come in contact with oxygen. <laughs> and so they didn't get in and clean all that up, right? Do you think they got in there and cleaned that all up before the radioactive plumes came true? Huh? Do you? Huh? Huh? Do you really? Huh? Maybe you should get your head checked. Maybe you should shut your mouth. Maybe you should shut that pie hole if you really think that that didn't get radioactive followed. Maybe you're a traitor to your loved ones and your families and your friends or anybody that respects you because they don't understand how twisted you actually are. That you try to cover this up. You shut your pie hole around here anyway. I catch you out there, I'll correct you. The nuclear industry is out there saying, no, that's no problem. There was no tsunami, Dana. It done jack shit damage, Dana. Because most people won't go look and don't understand it. Didn't look at it. Didn't put any thought into it. Too busy with the with the stuff that the six corporations provide for them to distract them. Everything you read, everything you hear on TV or radio or in the theaters or in the music or in concerts is all just six corporations orchestrating a paradigm for you to live in and for you to give, have no free will and no self-respect for yourselves or your friends or your families and to become a pig in society and a burden to everybody around you because you don't, you, your self-gratification exceeds any kind of uh, compassion or morals not that these people have moral compasses coming coming through so an enormous amount of energy and power but at the same time radioactive follow burying everything so as this is floating offshore radioactive plumes are coming down and landing on this all the time and, and out there right now is still getting more radiation accumulating that radiation and think about radiation as think about a, a, you got a car battery, you take a screwdriver and you leave it out. You can magnetize a screwdriver permanently. You take something that's not magnetized and magnetize it permanently. You can do the same thing with radiation and, and that's why we have transgenic waste sites where they take gloves and tools that got contaminated, cross-contaminated. But you can you can uh, take a, a, a um, sandblaster on that hammer and sandblast all you know, half an inch down, but that hammer is still radioactive. That's how radiation works. It goes right through the metals. That's why they have like four feet of cement for bunkers to keep the radioactive fallout from atomic bomb zones in times of war away because the particles can pound through it, but at the same time, they're changing the free radicals of the metal yeah, that's got to be one of the most heartbreaking sites that I, I there's a house out on the ocean, because I spend most of my life on the ocean or in the ocean. So this thing comes flying through the country, depositing and ripping and chainsawing and, and just bulldozing its way through, turning everything, putting everything through a wood chipper, whether it's a car or a propane tank, no matter what it is, it's going through that wood chipper buildings and hotels and infrastructure and highways it all went through that infrastructure that's a, a tsunami debris in the pacific ocean from a plane you can't really tell i think this one really tells the story so the radiation plumes are coming through here 
even after this was plowed through and it just the radiation is settling on this all the time even today if it's still there it's settling on it but they got to burn all of this in incinerators and then the jet streams bring it throughout those communities then into the ocean or across to north america and if it goes in the ocean it's here because this uh the you know the worst thing we could do was uh put this stuff in an incinerator because you're just liberating at 3000 degree fahrenheit temperatures the radioactive isotopes back into the environment it's the worst possible thing we could do with this material and so they have no con they have no they know what they're supposed to do but that costs money they're not going to do it because they're a corporate personhood and they can't go to jail they can just get a big fine but nobody can get a criminal record all you can do is get a big fine it's corporate personhood see you don't have corporate person you go to jail <laughs> right and you can never run that business again because you got a criminal record they don't get that that don't happen to them they get a fine the company gets a fine no one says eric smith you wrote this software and your company used it no they say google got a fine they don't say eric smith is a criminal which is what he is 100 percent so is mark zuckerberg no no they get a, they get a fine and then they put up on the media as some kind of profit so it's despicable how we live in a society one rule for them and and harsh punishments for the rest the untouchables right but all the radiation here is coming oh dear is coming over here because they burn it in incinerators this will kill your children this will kill everything on the coastline and it already has uh, and i cover i'll you know i'll be covering more of that as we get we we're coming up to the end of the show in 19 minutes and so look at this think about this the, the, just hell right and there's no mercy for these people they've been to hell already just the earthquake was held for everybody and then the tsunami it took out their, their entire generations their whole history it gone and then everything behind it is radioactive but the, the government insists on telling everybody it's not and that everybody can move in and that children and women can have houses for free and that these people are not being lynched in the street to shut them to, to end their to, to restore dignity because that's the only way you're going to restore dignity these people are not going to give up being evil that government is not going to give up that power and that could be taken away from them but they're going to use the system because the system couldn't get a job anywhere else so it it will obey whatever will make them keep their pensions and their jobs and their children are getting jobs in the government in the future and they don't want to lose all of that and so they'll murder you to keep that and to expand what they got the only way to keep what they got and expand what they got is to get rid of you there is no shortcut and probably um you know one of the most Uh, one of the most bizarre pictures imaginable and you know the prospects for him making it through the next 10 seconds are not good have you know when you look at videos of what this thing does when you look at what this thing the power of a tsunami does that that camera that he's holding and that press badge that he got on I doubt highly he's going to survive. You know, it's just frustrating in every sense of the word. And look at her, you know, that's hands and fingers. She's back at her home and whoever was there got impaled on a part of their home or close to their home. So did that country not suffer enough? And even right now, she's there, everything around her is radioactive from the radiation that they're hiding away on her no one's going to be honest no one's going to tell the truth no one's going to make a stand no one's there's no honor that's why we exist is to try to restore some dignity to the human spirit and to make some sense out of why this is happening to us it's just because a thousand a few thousand of the powerful nuclear people have perpetrated this. just a few thousand people perpetrated all of this upon them and us and continue to exterminate us 
because they refuse to accept what they got done to the entire planet. See, they say they want to get rid of 95% of the human species, but what we're doing, we're killing every species on the planet. We're destroying uh, the very foundation of life itself. Uh, and the Pacific Ocean, and you couldn't, you can't say the Pacific Ocean is too late already. But does that mean we we try? Does that mean we don't hold those accountable? Accountable? Does that mean we don't look for a better way forward? Does that mean we don't try to mediate? Does that mean we don't try to come up with technology? Uh, does that mean we don't have the capacity? Of course not. We have that. That is who we are, and what we see here is the dark side of us. And what we see coming uh, is an awakening of moral and ethical principles that might sustain the human species into the future. But the, what we use now in place of that can't sustain anything, right? So all of this is radioactive debris and it has to be burned. All of this is hell on earth without the meltdown of reactors in the equation. But the meltdown reactors make this uh, millions of times worse. Every square meter is millions of times worse because of those melted reactors throughout the entire country. And what do you think they're going to do with all that debris? Gather it all up and burn it throughout the prefectures and the incinerators. And then that's re-liberated constantly through rain, through snow, through typhoons, through convection, through evaporation, through the processes that this whole ecosystem survives upon. Uh, and so this is all radioactive debris. And so these people are better off in Chernobyl. It's so radioactive than living in their own country. Is there a future for nuclear? Is there any way nuclear can be equated with clean and green and carbon free? It's the most ludicrous thing imaginable. You gotta, you gotta have 400 train cars to get a gram of this stuff, of cold. 400 train cars. Which is, you know, a couple of million watts. And a gram of it is a million watts. When you're funny. Because you can't use the coal because you use hem harsh chemicals to separate it. You use massive amounts of water to separate it. And then that is all dumped into communities and landfills. And then just create the enriched uranium. Our whole country, the whole country is peppered with nuclear waste sites that is leaching into all the communities, that is hemorrhaging into all the communities, that can't be contained, that you can't have a sarcophagus without a vent. And by the time you might come up with a sarcophagus for a vent, this stuff would be thousands of years old. We don't have the technology. To, it will detonate. If you, if you don't vent it, it'll detonate if you vent it. And so you have to vent it before the gases build up all the time. So boiling a million gallons of water in a reactor and then venting it through the steam that's coming out is how they do it. And so you have radioactive fallout in your communities with all the nuclear power plants, but also all the waste sites are constantly, you, these are not holding sites, these are holding sites temporarily. They don't know what to do with it. And all countries are like that. There is zero future and they have to lie to you and tell you like, like a banana or a potato chip or walking in the sunshine in order to pacify. And, and, but they have to repeat that for 70 years and they can't use anything else. That's all they got. They can't, any other lie will be too obvious. And so they keep saying that same lie. But everything you're seeing here is radioactive. And everything that was cleaned up is going to be burnt and re-liberated into an environment. So they went and plowed it all out of the way and left a shrine there. Right? The, the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that, 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 that was up high enough and that the structure itself was was clean enough and that the, it was at the edge of the debris field, you can see, right? So that managed to survive, and which is cool. I'm not putting that down. But those buildings down there, if you can see that, there be no windows, there be no furniture, there be no walls inside of it. These guys are looking for bodies And so all of this is radioactive. All of this is useless. All this has to be, this is all nuclear waste in every context of the word. 
Um, and so that debris field will come over. <coughs> hi, Miss Milky, Jen. <coughs> I'm gonna come over and say hi to everybody. My throat's a little freaked up. So I'm probably just gonna end the stream because I scratched right out on me here. But I'm gonna go over and talk to everybody for a few minutes How about that. And so just in on saying that this debris field is through the Pacific Ocean and that we went through the headlines the last couple of days showing you that the plume was the entire way across the Pacific Ocean. These were headlines that where they admitted that the plume stretches from Japan to North America and all the way in between. So they're worried about a terrorist bomb detonating a small nuclear bomb in a plume, that little tiny plume coming like a couple of pounds of explosives and a few grams of, of uh, hospital radioactive material being dispersed through the community. And they're worried about that plume coming through the community. What about a plume that's 5,000 miles across, 5,000 miles the other direction, and 15 to 20 miles high? What do you think that means? And so anybody or anything or everything is going to be radiated now. It's like walking. Okay, I want you to think about it this way, but I want to give you something visible. Think about a car wash that you drive through. Now think about instead of... So think about the first one uh, spray and it's humans walking through it. And so the first spray is a really fine mist and then they walk five feet and then the next spray is like a talcum powder so it's big enough you can see it white and then the next spray is talcum powder is red but it's just a little pff. and then the next spray is a talcum powder yellow and then they come out the other side and do you think they're gonna be clean and shiny or do you think they're gonna be you know yellow and red and you know what I mean? Well, that's what is going on with the fallout. You can't see it, though. So you can't see these colors. But it's landing on everything, and everything is coated. And so we got to come up with technology. Just because it seems insurmountable, does that mean that we just pack it in? Uh, if it's going to be too hard, we're not going to try. What about your life depends upon it? If somebody knocks you down right now, and there's 500 people there, and he starts choking you, uh, but say they're not, you know, all you got to do is like break your arm, hit their arms and you can knock your arm, their arms off you. In one sense, would you do that? Would you try to stop them from choking you? If you were out on the road and there was a car coming to you, you were stood in the highway, and say there was a stranger there, and somebody's driving towards them, but they're like a quarter mile away and they're starting to blow their horn saying, get out of the way! And they slow down a little bit, but they're still traveling at 30, 40 miles an hour, and they got a convertible, and they're, they're stood up in the convertible, and they're yelling out, Get out of the way! I'm not going to stop. I'm going to run you over. You don't get out of the way. And they're blowing their horn. Get out of the way! And they're closer now. And these people are like, What? And they don't, they don't seem to even comprehend it. Would you, A, uh, yell at them too? B, run out and, and try to get them out of the way? C, ignore it and get out there on the road with them. You know, that's questions you gotta ask yourself. <laughs> Not me. I know what I would do. I know what you would do. I think I do. I hope I do. I assume I do. I imagine I do. But when I apply that model to the average person, yeah. it doesn't seem to be that that happens. That they, they don't seem to understand what to do. Let's come back and, and let me find a picture while we talk to everybody. And so we raised a couple of thousand dollars. You kidding me? How fantastic is that? How amazing is that? That's a really good kickoff. And so that was three donations. Elaine, Miss Milky, and the other person didn't want to be named, but uh, Elaine and Miss Milky was 90% of that donation on top of that. So I just want to acknowledge that of the significance of what you've done for me. Uh, not that you needed to do something that crazy right away for me. 
And you know what I'm like, I guess, in one sense that I'm going to push really hard for it and that this might help everybody understand that this is not a game. This is what we do sometimes is, is in order to fund an operation. We have to uh, start raising money. And this is how we've done 15,000 miles of the coastline. And so we, we funded that whole operation and done 15,000 miles of the coastline in 260 days out of 365 days. The rest of it was getting ready to run back out. Long extended trips of the entire coastline repeatedly because we know this is true. We know we flushed this out and we needed to go look ourselves because nobody else would. And I was supposed to do something here, whatever that was. Oh yeah, come on and say hi to everybody. Good night to everybody. Good day to everybody. Hi, Terry Ann, Albert, Aunt Chester, Chuck, and Ellie, and Celeste, Billy J. And we got lots of people here today. Miss Milky, Elaine, um, Amthurst, Amthurst, and Patrick, and Bob, uh, and Kate, of course, Starlight. And Kate, do you find Kate's links below? There's lots of people's links below. Kate got the Fukushima Hounds Independent Support Group. And uh, they, that's what they do. They support the Fukushima, everybody in Fukushima. And uh, this family that is here right now is a well-organized, very endearing, endearing family. Mickey and Gary. And I mean, we're going to get some PR firms show up here and infiltrate it. That's what they do. If you have a demonstration, the police will dress up as demonstrators and march with the demonstrators and, and ingratiate themselves into our very, you know, company. I'm not saying anybody I'm talking to here is that way, but I'm just saying that, in, you know, you will find that in every, on every site about Fukushima, that going on. and you, But you'll also find the outrageous, outlandish uh, trolls the flamers, uh, the hard boils, and it's just my throat is shot today. Like I said, two radio shows yesterday, and they're, they, they were great shows, both of those radio, uh, with Lonnie, Nuts for Art, Lonnie Clark, and uh, Richie Allen, the Richie Allen show in the UK, and then the live stream here yesterday. And thank you, Adam, Yar, Kate, thank you, folks, everybody, uh, and gesture. Miss Milky, somewhere over the rainbow, far, far away. Thomas is in the house, Thomas Ackerman. You'll find Thomas's links below. And these are all people that are very conscious people, very aware people. And the majority of them are hardcore uh, with their narratives on Fukushima. But lots of people have life lessons. And uh, just making sure I say hello to everybody before I take off. And so, and see if I can add anything to what I said already without straining my voice too much. So the, the TriCaster is a broadcaster. It's what CNN, BBC, 10 years ago, you couldn't get one for less than a million dollars. Uh, five years ago, there were still uh, several hundred thousand dollars. Now you can get them for around $12,000 with all the bells and whistles, right from the guys who used to make the million dollar ones. And they democratizing uh, filmmakers is how they put it. And it just has everything there. I can make a, a science fiction movie. I can make documentaries. I can make uh, Hollywood feature movies. I really can with that software. I can do major interviews at the one time. I can incorporate the sound effects. And so you just have like a little board. You have like a little board about the size of that. But you can also use an iPad. And you get these um, the mini controllers, and so they're like little keypads. And but each keypad you can assign a video or a picture or or a conversation or an interview or a telephone call, you know, like all kinds of functions um, to them, and pre-program it all and then run into sequences. I can wave like that, and that'll trigger some kind of effects on the screen or anything else I want to assign it. Uh, you can preload. 99, each segment 99 segments, and each segment has 99 of them. And so you go in each segment, you can have everything laid out there, so you can always come back to it and have it extremely organized. But also, most importantly, you can uh, it can handle 
uh, 70 million pixels uh, video, for instance, and not uh, freeze up on you or something like that. You can stream that out to three live websites at the one time. It can also post to Facebook and Twitter that is streaming and that the stream is over and that the videos, it can chop the videos up after the stream and post them to such that don't stream. And so it's like having uh, five or six people dedicated to doing the task and it never complains, right? Uh, but it always does what you told it to do. So it'll put the same tags everywhere that you gave it. Very handy for what I'm doing. But it also allows you to incorporate any kind of effect, but, but not the fake effect. It doesn't look fake. You can make a Hollywood style production movies with this and it's extremely high quality. And so that's what we're raising the money for now. We're, so we're on the push for it right every day now. And we're 2000 just shy, a couple of dollars shy of 2000 And so that's, we're off to a good kick. And so every day I will be pushing that out there. And slowly I'm going to bring in data to sh share with everybody to push it a little bit harder if I got to. And at this stage, everybody knows what I'm like. Now at the same time, i got to raise $1,500 for the lighting system to do this properly, to, for those effects. And then uh, the microphones are around uh, three or four hundred dollars each. You need at least two of those and two cameras that are around six or seven hundred dollars each. And these are cabaret cameras are a certain, um, a, a certain configuration that allows me to crunch it, that system to crunch it, and not lose the resolution and still put it out and get it up on the internet in real time in super high quality on your end. So I can take the highest quality videos that will crash just about any computer trying to load it, let alone trying to play it, let alone trying to incorporate it, let alone trying to utilize it in, in the software and not have it crashing on you. This stuff won't crash. So I can load up endless footage, all my footage, everything I got into this, and I can access any of it and it still won't crash that system. And it'll reconfigure and format the audios into an Adobe. So very cool stuff. Very high, high pro. And I can interview, bring people into the conversation. I can key them out. So if you're outdoors, I can key out everything around you, bring it into my studio, and then I'm there too. Or I can key out everything around you, bring you into the studio, and whatever I got in the studio is where you're too all of a sudden. But you can walk around in my studio. Like that's crazy stuff. And people won't realize for the better part that you're not in my studio. If done even reasonably well. And this stuff it was made stupid simple. That was the design of it. And I've looked at it and drooled over it heavily. And so I want to just thank everybody. And particularly Elaine and Miss Milky, Jan Brooks for getting this off to such a great start. And now I'm going to come in and say hello to everybody before my voice actually stops. But we are we got one more stream tomorrow, and I got the day off tomorrow. I got an interview, not a radio interview. Yeah, so you can go. Miss Melky put it there. Go to PayPal, and type in my email is how it works. So you type in Dana D A N A one word Durnford D U R N F O R D at hotmail dot com, or you can go over to the nuclear proctologist and uh, go to uh, contacts, you'll see a donating button there for credit cards. But I am gonna change it soon on my site so you can donate with, uh, with your debit card. And I'm still working through that process. But soon I'll have that up there and people will be able to donate with their debit card, 50 cents or a dollar or something. And that's what we would love to see in the future, stuff like that, and then nobody has a burden. But right now, we're doing what we're doing because we are left with no options and because we flushed this out so well with so much energy and so much honesty and so much thought put into it throughout this whole collective that is us. And I say Dana and Hounds of Fukushima. And I just use that as an endearing nature of how I think of these people as, as us if we are one. But I understand I'm the guy who's usually front and center and takes all the abuse. And so everybody gives me a little tiny bit of leeway because of that and I appreciate it. But I'm no different than everybody else. I'm the same. I'm no different than you. I'm no better than you. I'm, I'm the same person. And without you, I don't exist anyway, as far as I'm concerned. I do what I do, but I don't think I could ever succeed without the support that I get. I can't imagine how that could be, right? How could I? And so I always recognize that and as is humbled by it. Hugs for everybody. 
We'll see you tomorrow, Friday, episode 9. I'm going to keep it a secret, but it's about Japan, Radioactive Fallout. And tomorrow's going to be a really good show. It's the last of the five series on Japan in these series. And so it's going to be a really, a really good episode. It's 10 a.m. Pacific Canada time, British Columbia. And once again, you can catch the live streams at Beautiful Girl by Dana, the website nuclearproctologist.org for the documentations of the 15,000 miles of coastline that we crowdfunded and we suffered together to get done. It's a very cool thing what we've done. Hugs for everybody. Take care, folks.